Richard Nixon knew that the way to people's hearts, and hopefully their votes, was through a dog. And he wasn't the only president who knew that. There have been many presidential pooches who have graced the White House lawn. And today, we're going to tell you about them, including one named Satan and one who could have been the key to preventing a nuclear catastrophe. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash, where we rescue tasty scraps from the editing room floor in an unscripted interview show. Today, we discuss dogs in the White House and the effects of these DOTAS, dogs of the United States, or DOTAI, the effects that they have on American politics, policies, and people. Andrew Hager is the historian in residence at the Presidential Pet Museum. The last time we spoke with Andrew, there was no presidential pooch in the White House, but of course things have changed. The Bidens entered the White House with two German shepherds, Champ and Major, after Champ died at age 13, and Major was rehomed due to behavioral issues. They added Commander, also a German shepherd, and a cat named Willow to their brood. Stay tuned after our conversation for an update on the status of the Presidential Pet Museum and the new book that Andrew has just published about the history of presidential pets. Andrew, thank you so much for being with us today. So first of all, talk about the Presidential Pet Museum. It sounds like, you know, there should be a place on the mall in Washington, somewhere between the American History Museum and, you know, the Air and Space Museum. It's not at all. No, real estate, uh, and specifically in that location, will be very prohibitively <laughs> expensive. Um, no, right now we're a virtual museum. And uh, what happened was when the uh, museum changed directors around four years ago, um, there was no current physical home for the museum. And the current director, Bill Hellman, has been kind of wondering what he should do with it. You know, we've kicked around different ideas, like should we have a bus that travels from school to school or goes to senior centers where people can just get on and kind of like explore presidential pet history? Or should we have a physical brick and mortar location? During the Trump administration with no pets being in the White House, there, there was less interest in us. I mean, people were still curious, but there wasn't anything contemporaneous going on. So there was nothing to drive people to us just up front. So I think now we've seen so much interest since the election uh, that once the pandemic's over, Bill's going to be looking for some real estate somewhere in the D.C. Baltimore metro area to house the museum and our collection. Has there been a big increase now that a dog is coming back to the White House, interest in both the museum and dogs in general? Yes, there has been a tremendous increase. I think I've done more interviews in the last month than I did in the previous four years, and probably by a wide margin. I mean, it's just lots of people want to talk about this, and lots of people are curious. We're getting much more web traffic, more emails asking where we're located, all kinds of that, that sort of stuff. I know that the hashtag DOTUS has been trending. What does that mean to you? That is the dog of the United States. Now, whether, I mean, in this divided country, whether we can get everyone to agree that one or two dogs represent the United States, just as, uh, you know, that, that's probably going to be pretty difficult. But I'm guessing, um, I, I'd never heard this prior to the Biden administration, so I think this is a new coinage, actually. But um, it, it's interesting to see the different ways that people have of speaking about presidential pets and also to sort of see the flexibility of the English language as we move along and how we change things and our love of abbreviations and acronyms in our social media hashtag culture. I, I love it. Yeah, we went from POTUS to FLOTUS to SCOTUS. Supreme Court, and now we're doing Dotus, and gosh, I don't know. Um, what does the cat become? Like, is, is it Codus? Codus. Um, yeah. Well, I, 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 I was going to save this question for the very end, but I'll ask you now. I have heard a rumor that when the Bidens come to the White House, it's not just going to be two dogs. Have you heard that? I have heard that rumor, yes. Um, so far, there there hasn't been anything 
really substantial on that front other than just the announcement that they're considering a cat but we don't know what kind of cat i'm i'm presuming based on the fact that uh major is a rescue dog um that they and they have a relationship with the uh, delaware humane society that they will possibly consider a rescue cat um you know i'm i'm hoping because there's so many cats out there even more than dogs looking for homes well, with, with your title and at the museum, you'd figure you'd be the first to know and to be consulted on this, Andrew. Well, I, I'm waiting for Dr. Biden to give me a call, honestly. Okay. You know, and, we'll try to you know, If she hears the podcast, please, uh, Dr. Biden, I'm available. I, I can consult free of charge. Let's talk a little bit about the two coming inhabitants to the White House, the two incoming dotis. Don't I? Um, Champ and Major. Champ is 12 years old. They're both German Shepherds. Major's two. But the big news is that I think Major is going to be the first uh, rescue dog. He will be the first um, shelter dog, is the way I like to say it. Uh, just because, and this is splitting hairs a little bit, but um, Lyndon Johnson had a dog named Yuki who was found as a stray outside a gas station in Texas and was eventually given to him by his daughter. So there have been animals uh, like Yuki who've been at the White House and have been rescued from some circumstance or another. But this is the first time a, um, a family entering the White House has gone to a shelter and adopted a rescue dog. And so I, I think that's amazing. I, I think it's really indicative of the fact that so many people in the United States have started moving in this direction as far as acquiring their own pets. Um, just over the last 30 years or so, the idea of rescuing or adopting shelter dogs and cats uh, has really taken off. Whereas before, I think there was an inclination, inclination among a lot of people to go to a breeder to get a specific type of dog. And now they might still be looking for that specific type of dog, but they're, they're doing it in a more humane way or in a way that, um, you know, helps a dog who is already there rather than fostering a system, uh, you know, of force breeding and all of that. Cause it was a little controversial when Joe Biden adopted champ 12 years ago, wasn't it? There was because they, they did go to a breeder for champ and, uh, they got pushback on that. And I think that's part of the reason why, I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak entirely for the Bidens, but I think that's part of the reason why they ended up adopting a shelter dog with major. I mean, I know, Major was also like a picture of uh, Major and his litter mates was sent to the Bidens by their daughter. Uh, you know, so you have some other uh, familial pressures there as well. But um, yeah, I, I do think that initial controversy probably had an impact. Now, I know that when the United States gets a new dotus, we'll just use that term, we'll continue the hashtag. Um, when a new dog, uh, a president comes in with a, new, a dog, that dog gains in popularity, right? That is true, yes. Do you expect that to happen both with German Shepherds and more significantly with shelter dogs? My big hope is that it will it will be a giant boost to the shelter dog movement. Um, German Shepherds, I can see also gaining in popularity, although Shepherds can be a somewhat more difficult breed depending on the amount of space you have. I mean, they, they're quite large. They can be quite noisy. They require, they, they have a lot of energy and they require a lot of exercise. So they're not for everyone. But I, I do expect also the German Shepherds will see a boost. I My real hope is that the animal shelter movement and the rescue movement really gets a significant bump here. Now, I know you don't have any inside poop on, on this, but what do you, um, so having two German Shepherds in the White House, obviously the White House grounds has a lot of German Shepherds. They're used by the Secret Service for bomb detection and, and as guard dogs. How do you think the Dotuses will get along with the uh, working dogs at the White House? Well, I mean, that's probably going to depend a lot on the training that the uh, that the dogs have had. Now, Champ, having lived with the Bidens at the vice presidential residence, would have some familiarity with that type of security dog. So for Champ, I think it will probably come a little easier. Although one can only imagine that Major, over the course of the last two years, has had similar experiences when traveling with the uh, president-elect and with Dr. Biden because they've had security all of this time. And I'm sure there have been bomb sniffing dogs and, and just general police canine units around. So 
you know, maybe they're maybe they'll be used to it at this time. Let's uh, put on your historian hat here and let's go back to the first dogs to inhabit the White House. Obviously, uh, George Washington, the White House wasn't built, but our second president, John Adams, had a dog with a very interesting name. John Adams had two dogs that we know of. Both were mixed breed. One was named Juno and the other was named Satan. Now, we don't know anything else about Satan other than the name, but I, I just have to imagine what that would mean in today's political climate. You know, like if Joe Biden had named his dog Satan instead of Major, for instance, you know, like that would have been an attack ad, right? <laughs> I mean, you, know, you know that, that would have been, that been out yeah. there. Uh, Tucker Carlson will be talking about Satan every night on his show, um, you know, and it'd be part of the war on Christmas. It's just the way our society is now. In John Adams' day, uh, you know, I, I'm still surprised that John Adams would have a dog named yeah. Satan because you're talking about, what, 100 years removed from the Salem witch hunts, uh, which uh, happened not very far from where he lived. So you would think there would still be that culture of, uh, you know, maybe don't name your dog after the devil. On the other hand, it's possible that Satan was just, you know, a, a bad dog. And I hate to cast aspersions on a dog uh, we have no details on. Maybe Satan was a very good boy, but, um, uh, you know, it's a possibility, right? Maybe John yeah. Adams had a wry sense of humor, but from what we know about President Adams, not so much. Yes. Well, I mean, he, on, on occasion, but it was usually uh, mixed with bitterness as far as I can tell. <laughs> So Harry Truman famously said that if, you know, you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. True? Well, I mean, Truman didn't live by his own uh, statement. He was given a dog named Feller, and he kept it very briefly before passing it along. Uh, and when he, was, when he was questioned about the dog later, you know, reporters were like, well, where's your dog? And he had just forgotten about it. He was like, what dog? What are you talking about? And he even said something to a friend of his at one point, like, ah, I didn't even want that damn dog, you know? So you've got Harry Truman, uh, you know, credited with this statement about getting a dog, but uh, not, not really living that lifestyle. I mean, um, you know, and again, perhaps like President Trump, it's just not who he was. His, his daughter, Margaret, does record in her book, White House Pets, that he was often feeding the squirrels that would come up onto the portico during their lunch. So it's not like he was opposed to animals. I guess he just didn't want the regular care and maintenance that a dog would require. You were talking a little bit about the the fact that Harry Truman didn't have a dog, but the, 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 the potential that a dog could soften the image of a president. Which president do you think benefited most from having, having that, you know, I have a dog. I'm, 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 more, of a, I'm more like you than you would imagine. You know, I think the the obvious example, the go-to, is Richard Nixon with checkers. Uh, I mean, that's why we have National Dogs in Politics Day in September. Um, you know, Nixon is going to be kicked off of Eisenhower's presidential ticket because there's there's this scandal that he's taking these gifts that he shouldn't be taking from wealthy Republican donors. And he goes on TV. The Eisenhower people think Nixon's going to resign. But instead, Nixon gives this speech defending himself and exonerating himself. And at the end, he says, we did receive this dog as a gift. And my kids love checkers. and We're going to keep checkers. And he kind of like wraps up the speech by like focusing on this dog. And, you know, next thing you know, the Eisenhower campaign is getting all these telegrams like, oh, don't get rid of this nice man. You know, he didn't do anything wrong. Really boost Nixon's image. You know, he'd been essentially he was a political hatchet man. I mean, he was you know, going after Alger Hiss and doing all of this uh, red baiting, you know, McCarthyist kind of stuff. Um, but he softens his image with that dog. And even though Checkers, uh, unfortunately, didn't make it to the White House with Nixon because Nixon wasn't elected president himself for another 16 years, um, I, I think that's the, that's the example I would go to first as far as softening an image. You could also look at Herbert Hoover, who was seen as this bureaucrat, uh, he hadn't run for elected office before. People had an image of him as a stiff. Uh, his campaign took photos of him and his dog, made uh, made thousands of posters and spread those around the country, and it helped him get elected. So, you know, we're talking almost 100 years ago, people knew that the dog could be beneficial for your public relations side. Um, and, and those are the two, the two gentlemen who I think exploited that uh, to their own greatest personal benefit. Certainly did. Actually, when I was in college, 
I was a rhetoric major, and one of the speeches that we had to, that I spent a lot of time with was the Checker speech, and it was a very impactful speech, and it did change everything, didn't it? When I think of um, uh, other dogs that are sort of like, you know, etched into my psyche, I, I think of FDR's dog. Fala is another very important dog, and another point where a politician used the dog for political gain. Um, there were, Republicans were spreading a story that Fala had been left behind on one of the Aleutian Islands during a presidential trip, and that they'd had to turn around this military destroyer to go pick the dog up at a cost of millions of dollars to taxpayers. And FDR was giving a speech before the Teamsters Union, and he you know, kind of went after the critics for even bringing up his dog. These Republican leaders have not been content with attacks on me, or on my wife, or on my sons. No, not content with that. They now include my little dog, Fallon. <laughs> Well, of course, I don't resent attacks, and my family don't resent attacks, but Fallon does resent attacks. So Fallon, you know, kind of plays a role in FDR's uh, political career and also, you know, helped FDR make his political opponents look ridiculous. And he's, uh, you know, he was considered such a constant companion to FDR that the uh, the monument to FDR in D.C. has a Fala replica there with FDR as well. Has any other presidential pet been so honored? Because that's the official FDR monument, isn't it? Yes. And, and that is, you know, for something like that on an official level, yes, that's unique. Now, I will point out also that Warren Harding... Uh, who had been a newspaper uh, publisher prior to being president. When he died in 1923, newsboys around the country collected pennies, which they melted down to make a statue of his of his dog, Laddie Boy. And that statue is at the Smithsonian. I mean, there is no, well, as far as I know, there's no official Warren Harding monument. Your museum, the, the genesis of the new museum, started with a very unusual uh, thing that we affectionately call floof here at Dog Podcast Network. <laughs> Tell us about that. So the the woman who founded the Presidential Pet Museum is Claire McLean. And Ms. McLean was a dog groomer um, and her mother had some political connections. And so at one point, Claire was hired to groom the Reagan's Bouvier Lucky. And she was brought to the White House. And, uh, you know, according to the story, she was taken to some sort of shed that you wouldn't imagine would be on the grounds of the White House. But you know, for security's sake, it was just her and the dog and a Secret Service agent in the shed. She shaves the dog and then she kind of gathers up a bunch of the dog hair in a little bag and takes it home with her as a souvenir. And, you know, she ends up, she and her mother uh, on the side were doing artwork and they were using this hair as part of this mixed media art. So uh, our museum really started with a painting of Lucky that was done using Lucky's um, Lucky's dog hair. Are there other artifacts in the museum that are just like pretty extraordinary that we should talk about? Um, a lot of what we've ended up collecting, um, over, aside from Lucky's dog hair, a lot of what we've ended up collecting in the last three or four years that I've been involved with the museum has been mostly press photos and things like that. So we've got a lot of really interesting press photos. But you also find that whenever there are these presidential dogs, you'll have sort of a, a market out there, like a, a third party market where people are making toys that represent the presidential pets for one reason or another. Sometimes it's celebratory, you know, and sometimes it's used for political satire. Like um, I was on eBay and I found a Beanie Baby that we got for the museum that it was supposed to, supposed to be Bill Clinton's dog, Buddy. And Buddy was holding a, a tiny pair of underwear that said ML on it in his mouth. And uh, you could tell it was a piece of uh, Clinton impeachment humor. Uh, so, was it? Um, did, did you buy it? Did you? Was it real? I, I, I yeah, I, I bought two of them. Like one went to the museum. Uh, you know, they weren't that. I think they were only like four dollars or something. They might still be on eBay, guys. If you want to go out and get one, um, you know, you get that kind of thing. Um, and, and then you have these books. Uh, so often, especially recently, presidential pets have been, you know, 
turned into children's books. Uh, sort of the first one that I can that I think was really impactful was Barbara Bush writing Millie's book in the early '90s. Um, and I actually got that for Christmas one year when I was in fourth or fifth grade. And so I have a very special connection to that. Do you think that set the tone for your career? You know, it, it's tempting to look back on it now and, and say that, you know, like if you made a movie of my life, right, that would be the first scene, you know, like young Andrew opens up a box and there's this book and, you know, like then like 25 years later, you know, you see me like doing this interview with you. But yeah, like Bar Barbara Bush wrote that uh, you had uh, Hillary Clinton wrote a book called To Body to Socks. And so she was addressed. There were letters. Her book was a collection of letters written by children to her animals. And so, you know, we have those kinds of things. That's awesome. Well, when you talk about children's books and presidential pets, how can we exclude the one written by yourself? Well, yes. And I, uh, you know, I wasn't bringing that up just as a plug, but I, I will point out that I have two books that I've written for children. One is called Old Ike, and it's about Woodrow Wilson's tobacco chewing ram. Um, and the second is Pushinka, which is about JFK's dog. Uh, Pushinka is one of my favorite pets because the story is great. She was given to the Kennedys by Nikita Khrushchev, who was at the time the premier of the Soviet Union, our mortal enemy. Uh, but they they had a summit in 1961, and he and Jackie are sitting next to each other at a table. He's telling her about Belka and Strelka, who were these dogs that the Russians had sent into space and returned safely to Earth. Strelka had just had puppies, and Jackie says, oh, you have to send me one. You know, kind of the way that if you told me you had a beach house, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you got to have me out to your beach house sometime. And you would say, yeah, and then we'd never remember it, and it would never happen. Except Khrushchev actually sent the puppy to Jackie with a little Russian passport and the FBI had to come over and examine the dog for explosive devices and listening devices. And once they determined that the dog was good to go, the dog became part of the Kennedy family and eventually had puppies with, uh, with Charlie, who was one of JFK's other dogs. So you've got this little cold war romance aspect going on there too, which is great. Including a, including a, a mother that was, that flew in space. Yeah. I mean, like how much, how, how many things can you jam into this story, right? <laughs> you know, like, it's a lot. And then I, I've also read articles by historians suggesting that the exchange of gifts between Kennedy and Khrushchev, which included Pushenka, and then Kennedy had sent back a ship in a bottle, uh, which is not as good a gift. Like, if somebody gives you a dog, don't, don't send them a ship in a bottle unless you know that's really what they want. Um, but they had this exchange of gifts. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Yeah, yeah, pro tip, guys. Um, but they had this exchange of gifts. And then, uh, you know, about a year later, you've got the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the world comes to the brink of nuclear war, and the military advisors for both governments are telling Kennedy and Khrushchev, you know, like, we're going to have to go nuclear, this is going to get ugly, and this is it, we need to attack now. And both of these guys back away from the brink. And it's been suggested that, you know, maybe in some way, Pushinka is, is what saves us all from nuclear catastrophe. I mean, if somebody gives you a dog, are you likely to look at that person and think, oh, he's obviously evil and soulless and I should drop a nuclear bomb on him? What's that, what's that expression that you can tell a lot about a person by the way they treat their dogs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think Gandhi said something to that effect, right? Like you can judge a people, the character of a people by how they treat their animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so... It connects with um, uh, another uh, a clip that I recently heard where uh, George W. Bush was talking about his experience with uh, Vladimir Putin and dogs. Have you heard that? No, I haven't. I, I remember the quote about Bush saying he looked into Putin's soul at one point, um, but I, I haven't heard this about Putin and dogs. Uh, what is it? Uh, so I can't do it as, as good a justice as uh, the president himself, but basically... Putin was at the White House and he saw uh, Bush's dog, the Scotty. Um, with Barney. Barney. He saw Barney and, and said, <laughs> that's a dog. Something like that. The next time they met, this was, I guess, in Russia. And uh, Putin showed him his dog, which is this giant Russian wolfhound. <laughs> and he said, my dog, effectively, my dog can kick your dog's butt. This is a real dog. <laughs> And I think that may have informed Bush's opinion of Putin. 
uh, Putin did the whole like crocodile Dundee, like that's not a knife. This is a knife, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, that's that's terrific. It, it, I think the dogs really do humanize. Let's talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and at really high stressed points in a president's life, do they ever turn to a dog for comfort and respite from that? There's a great photo. Uh, you can probably find it online. I know we have a copy of it at the museum. Uh, it's Richard Nixon the night before his resignation. And he's sitting in the living room kind of looking dejected. And his uh, dog, Vicky, is curled up on the ottoman by his feet. And, you know, you can just kind of see in this photo that he is getting some comfort from this dog. And it is a very humanizing moment because I can imagine, you know, if I were going to lose my job. And, you know, l let's remember that, like, resigning the presidency is a lot different from, you know, let's say getting fired from Burger King because everybody in the country is watching you, you know, like it's public shame that's going to last you the rest of your life and everybody's going to talk about it. And so he's under this incredible weight uh, and burden of what must have been the hardest decision he'd ever had to face. And he's there with his dog and you can kind of put yourself in his shoes a little bit, seeing that picture. Um, and I never want to be in Richard Nixon's shoes in that way, but, um, yeah, it, it is a very, it, it's heartwarming, uh, to, a, to a certain degree. Nixon had Vicky, you know, in, in your hard times. I mean, maybe, maybe it would have benefited president Trump to a certain extent to have some sort of pet like that. Uh, but you know, he wasn't a dog person. He, he made that clear in a speech and that's fine. I mean, I guess it's good to be self-aware. And if you don't like dogs, don't get one just for your image. You he know, was offered. He animal. was he was offered a golden doodle, wasn't he? Yeah, he was offered a golden doodle named Patton. Um, and I, I even read somewhere that Barron seemed to be interested and in, in kind of wanted the dog, but the Trumps ended up turning it down. And I I think it's just not really who Donald Trump is, right? Like that's not his brand. He's he's a businessman. He's you know, everything's about luxury and, and expensive suits and gold plated this and that. The idea of Donald Trump, you know, kind of like rolling up his shirt sleeves, taking off his tie and rolling around on the, the ground with a dog. You just can't picture it. Right. So and I think he knew that about himself. And rather than do something incredibly phony, um, you know, I, I'm not one to. Yeah. Uh, I guess off the record, since this is going to be edited, I'm not one to give Trump a lot of credit on a lot of things. But I will say, just as far as that goes, if you know you don't like animals and you don't get one, that's good. You made the right choice. So there's something he did. Like, good job, Donald. Let's talk about uh, a president who did roll around in the ground, LBJ, with his dogs. LBJ loved dogs. I mean, you know, you're talking a guy from West Texas. He'd grown up with animals in a rural setting. And so his... His experience with animals was very different than a lot of presidents and, and very different, in fact, than President Kennedy, who'd come right before him, who was, you know, East Coast, Harvard, uh, you know, like elite. And they had animals, but, uh, you know, they probably always had somebody taking care of the animals for them. Johnson was much more hands on, um, sometimes to his detriment, uh, as with the uh, famous picture from Life magazine where he's got his beagle him and he's holding him up by the ears. Um Johnson didn't seem to realize that that would be a problem. Like he, he'd been doing it for years with the dog and he thought the dog liked it. Um, you know, he just, even in 1964, you couldn't do that with your dogs. I mean, and we've come a long way since 1964. I'm not trying to say that people should have been able to do that, but, uh, you know, even back then people were like, well, hold up LBJ. You can't pick up the dog by the ears. But, um, but he also just in general, uh, there's also a great record called Dogs Have Always Been My Friends, where it's LBJ talking about his history with dogs. And then he and Yuki start singing like Yuki is howling and Johnson's howling along with him with him. And the two of them keep this up for several minutes. And it's it's adorable, you know, and, and it gives you another side of, of Johnson. And it confirms some of what we already believed about him, you know, in terms of being sort of this larger than life and perhaps you know, not very concerned with manners or with what's prim and proper, but just with, you know, kind of this earthy uh, sort of sensibility, um, you know, it reinforces that. But also, yeah, for, for those of us who want to see Johnson as something more than just a man in a suit behind a desk, um, 
you know, you do get to see him as a regular person playing with his dogs, just like you or I would. I understand that he kept uh, uh, candy, anyway, vitamin, dog vitamins in his in the in the in his drawer in the Oval Office. I had not heard that, but that does not surprise me because you know that's. You know, if you're a person who loves dogs, and I found this out because I was a teacher before I was a presidential pet historian, and I am legally blind, so I travel with a guide dog, a black Labrador named Sammy, and when I was a teacher and I got the guide dog, suddenly there were like five different teachers around the building who started keeping like milk bones in their desks, and my dog knew who each one was, and every day it was like, uh, you know, he had to go to every single one of those people once a day to get his treat from that person or he would be unhappy, you know? And I, I, Johnson is the kind of guy who strikes me like that. He's going to keep something in the desk because he wants the dog to come around. It's also a good break for him from dealing with the stress of, uh, you know, Vietnam, uh, you know, the riots and things that were happening in the United States at the time, the general political unrest. Um, you know, Johnson had a lot going on, particularly in his, uh, you know, term from 65 through 69 that would have caused any, any ordinary person to have a lot of stress. So you want to do something that's going to bring the dog around so you can get a few pets and maybe cool off for a little bit. Well, that's what I understand. And I think there's just in the Margaret Truman book that uh, LBJ had these uh, candy coated vitamins in his drawer. And I'm not sure if they were for people or for dogs. And then he would uh, (laughs) get up, open the door. And, uh, and somehow that was a signal that they would release the dogs from wherever they were. And he would go out and play with them and give them those, uh, those candy coated supplement uh, vitamins. The, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. And again, it's, it's totally relatable, right? I mean, you can just imagine yourself at the end of a long day of working from home or whatever, you know, you've had the door closed because you can't have the dog in here jumping up in the middle of the podcast and doing whatever. And, you know, now you're going to go play and you're going to romp around. You got the treats, you you know, very, very relatable. We're going to take a break right here, but we'll be right back. And now a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Ever Pup. The green grassy beef liver spiked smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. Everpup traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. Does it roll back time? Of course not. Not really. But it helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day. Because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so grateful to be your dog. And for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. We're back with Andrew Hager. Let's talk a little bit about the um, precision of being a historian of presidential pets, because this is not something that is incredibly well chronicled by the contemporary press at the time that you can go back to and look at. Like the National Archives doesn't handle this stuff, does it? Well, let, let me put it this way. One of the things I like to tell people is that you can see the relationship between Americans and their pets born out in, uh, you know, over the course of the last 230 years by the relationships that presidents have to their pets. You know, in the beginning, they were mostly working animals and people weren't documenting to a large extent, you know, 
the life of George Washington's horses because, okay, it's a horse. He lives on a, on a, on a farm or a plantation. He's got horses. He's got some hound dogs. He's got some sheep, that kind of thing. Um, you know, Washington would have put those things in his records, but nobody from the media was sitting down to write about George Washington's foxhounds in any, any great detail. You know, it, it really isn't until you get to Warren Harding and Laddie Boy, which is sort of the first celebrity presidential pet, that the media starts to pay more attention and the pets start to come more to the front and center of, uh, of American politics. Are there any examples of uh, uh, bereavement at the White House for a presidential pet? Um, the Kennedy children buried a parakeet in the Rose Garden. And I believe maybe the Eisenhower grandchildren uh, had another bird that passed away. Um, you do have occasional things like that. But generally speaking, um, when the animals are at the White House, that's probably one of the safer places for an animal to be. You've got all these different people who are minding you and staff who can look out for you. And if, if you run off, the Secret Service will come find you. So, um, Although didn't one of LBJ's dogs get out? I believe so. Um, I, I know that um, there have been animals that have gotten out. I know Calvin Coolidge's raccoons got loose every now and then and had to be tracked down. Um, he, it wouldn't surprise me if one of LBJ's animals got out, um, although the security at the White House obviously tightened up a great deal after the Kennedy assassination. I mean, JFK and Jackie used to walk the dogs themselves at night. They would sneak out from the Secret Service and walk the dogs ar around the streets of Washington. And, and that's just unthinkable now. But um, yeah, we, you, do have, you do have instances like that of, of animals passing away, usually not at the White House. But uh, I mean, we've had presidents like John Tyler when his horse died. He was so like upset. He, he like wrote this long thing that's on the horse's gravestone, you know, like explaining like how wonderful the horse was and yeah, you know, so you can really see a lot of love between presidents and, and their animals or presidential families and their animals. Um, but it's, you know, it's just a very different time. So let's get into the workings of, of dogs at the White House, the logistics, because we would like, I would like to think that the president of the United States is not, you know, in charge of feeding and cleaning up the poop. Uh, is that true? I, I, you know, I'm sure that occasionally a president or a first lady is going to do some cleaning up after a dog. I, I imagine that occasionally is far less than what you or I would do cleaning up after a dog. Because, yes, the president, even the first lady, they're going to have responsibilities beyond, um, you know, the normal household maintenance that you and I have. And so, you know, if a dog pees on a carpet in the East Room, maybe it shouldn't be Joe Biden down there spraying the nature's miracle. You know, it, it should be somebody else. I, I know, um, I don't know exactly who did the caretaking in, let's say the Obama household. I, I would think that when you have a family like that with children, the children are going to be a little bit more involved in the care of the animals and, and maybe given some responsibility. Um, during the, you know, fifties, sixties and seventies, there was an electrician named Travis Bryant who did a lot of the caretaking uh, for Eisenhower, Kennedy, LBJ, and, and Nixon's dogs. And I mean, I, I'm assuming in between like fixing whatever electrical things needed to be fixed at the White House, which hopefully wouldn't be all that often. You know, you'd think it's all state of the art, right? But um, but he did go, he did take care of Pushinka. He did take care of Charlie and and the other dogs that uh, the Kennedy had. And he would walk them and clean up after them. And he even, you know, did some, you know, like trying to teach them uh, tricks like he taught Pushinka to go up this uh, this ladder on the back of a slide and then to slide down the slide in front by putting a peanut on each step and letting the dog, you know, move to get the peanuts. So you know, in, in that case, you've got a staff worker who's taking on a lot of the responsibilities that you and I would generally do with our dogs. I'm assuming that's how it's going to be in a lot of ways with the Bidens. Um, uh, Dr. Biden's looking at working a working a full-time paid job in addition to her duties as first lady obviously the president's going to have a lot going on um but i do expect that you know we're going to see a lot of shots of them like walking the dog across the lawn to and from the helicopter 
you know, um, I, I think Kennedy was the first one who really started that tradition of when Marine One lands, I want to have my dog there waiting so I can see my dog when I get off the helicopter. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll see that. I mean, there are great photos of Ronald Reagan being dragged across the White House lawn by Lucky, his Bouvier, who was just so large. I mean, Bouviers are a larger breed. And even for a relatively strong person like Reagan, um, you know, they can they can drag you. Um, so, you know, we're going to see we're going to see that kind of footage and that kind of um, but that kind of imagery. But I, I do imagine that most of the work will be done by someone else. Do most of the presidential dogs, or they we would call indoor dogs, or have any of them ever been kenneled? I, I think probably in recent times you're looking at what we would call indoor dogs. Um, now, a long time ago, you go back like 50 or 60 years, then yes, it was more of like, uh, you know, the doghouse in the backyard type of thing, right? Um, that's... That because that was what was common in America at that time too. You know, you you had a dog, you'd fence in your yard, you'd put a dog house back there and tie the dog to the dog house at night, and maybe you would bring your dog in sometimes during the day, but it slept outside, and uh, that's that's a practice that's kind of worn away over the decades. But uh, in in those days, in the Kennedy days, the Eisenhower days, and especially before that, yes, the dogs would have been outside. Uh, I think in the 19th century, it was more common just to have the dog sleeping in the barn. Um, you know, like there there have been stories about uh, James Garfield's dog, Vito. Um, yes, he names his dog Vito. Uh, oh, you know, Vito, not the, V-I-T-O, V-E-T-O. V-E-T-O, yes. Like he, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to celebrate Italian heritage. He was, um, <laughs> he was talking about his power to override Congress. Yeah. Uh, but but that dog uh, apparently, uh, you know, alerted the staff to a fire that had broken out in the barn because, you know, the dog was in the barn all the time, uh, which which in those days was what you would have done. You, your animals sleep in this building that is specifically built for animals. Any uh, word on the more recent uh, White House dogs where they slept? Like, do they sleep with the president? Do they sleep with the first daughters or do you know? I, you know what, I don't know. And I'm hoping that when I, um, one of the things I'm secretly hoping for for Christmas is a copy of uh, Barack Obama's memoir. And I'm hoping when I read that, I'll find that out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that probably you're, you're going to get a, a bit of a mixture, right? Like you're, like with any dog, you're trying to create consistency. So if the dog has a special place where that dog is supposed to stay uh, and, and sleep, a place that's their own, like their own bed or, or crate or kennel, uh, that's where you're going to take them every night. But we all know that occasionally you're going to have the dog, especially if you have kids, your kids are going to have the dog on the bed and they're going to want to sleep with the dog. And Sasha and Malia were pretty young when they got to the white house. And I, I can imagine them, you know, when, when Bo shows up, uh, you know, as a Portuguese water dog, they, they don't really shed. That's one of the benefits, right? So you can have the dog on the bed and you're not going to end up with a, a big pile of hair afterwards. Like I would, if I had my Labrador on the bed. Now, speaking of Bo, I think I think it's important for us to uh, explain how Bo came into the picture. Because when Barack Obama was elected president in November, he did not have a dog. He did not. But apparently one of his promises to the children, uh, you know, as far as getting them to sign on to his presidential campaign, because, you know, think about it from the perspective of like a nine-year-old kid. Your dad is gone almost every day, all day, off campaigning, shaking hands, trying to raise money. Um, you know, you do see him, but it's very limited. And so it's a strain on the family. And I think one of the ways he got them to go along with this idea was, if I win, you're going to get a dog. And, um, you know, they had allergy issues. So they were looking for a, a dog that uh, would would have a lower... Po- I, I've heard there's no such thing as a hypoallergenic dog. Uh, maybe, maybe one of your listeners can correct me if that's wrong, but my understanding is there's no such thing as hypoallergenic dogs. It's just dogs that have a much lower amount of dander or uh, giving off the allergens. And Portuguese water dogs are one of those breeds of dogs. And he was recommended that by Ted Kennedy, uh, who actually gave them Bo. And uh, so Bo was a gift from Senator Kennedy, uh, who, who loved Portuguese water dogs. And then Sonny came a few years later, uh, to join Bo at the White House. And uh, we were talking about Champ and the Bidens acquiring Champ in 2008. 
Um, that was also uh, apparently, uh, you know, Vice President, now President-elect Biden wanted a dog. And Dr. Biden told him if they won the election, he could get a dog. So, you know, in that sense, he uh, I, I picture him being as, as happy as Malia and Sasha, you know, when he got his dog. So these so, are little extra incentives to to uh, to, to go all the way and, and win. You get a dog. Yes, yes. You, you got to go all the way. And it's also, you know, it's a good point that it, just as you're starting out with a campaign is not a good time to get a dog, honestly. Like if you think about, okay, we're going to spend the next like six months basically on the road sleeping in hotel rooms. That's not a good time to, to introduce a dog to your home. You really need more stability than that. So, um, you know, yeah, it, it's a reward and also just good practice as well. Like wait till you have a stable moment to bring that dog into your family. So what do you see for the first dotuses or doti as we're, as I, I think we'll, we'll extend this uh, metaphor. So what do you, what do you see for them uh, coming into the white house now? I, I look for a strong social media presence. I mean, that's something we've started to see from candidates and their dogs over the last couple of years. Um, you know, like Pete Buttigieg's dogs uh, have an Instagram account. I think Beto O'Rourke's dogs have an Instagram account. Bailey Warren, who is Elizabeth Warren's golden retriever, you know, Bailey was always out on the campaign trail. People would line up to take selfies with Bailey. I think Bailey has an Instagram account. I'm expecting that these dogs are going to be very big on social media. And I expect that the Biden campaign will also, in some ways, try to replicate a little bit of what the George W. Bush administration did with their dogs in terms of every year the Bush, uh, George W. Bush, um, they would put out a holiday video with Barney. It was called like Barney Cam and it followed Barney around the White House and you know, he would, he was always like trying to put on some kind of holiday pageant or, or something, you know, and interacting in the, in the process with various cabinet members or staff members. And, and I can see the Bidens doing something like that, like a, like a slicker version or a more um, 21st century version of that. Barney was kind of an early um, internet influencer, I guess. Andrew Hager, thank you so much. If folks want to get in touch with you or learn more about the Presidential Pet Museum, how do they do that? Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me. My email address is historian at presidentialpetmuseum.com. Uh, presidentialpetmuseum.com is where you can come look through all of our archives and see the information we have on all the various uh, White House pets going back to Washington and his hounds. And, um, you know, the, we have a Facebook page as well for presidential pets, which, which is where we share our uh, current information and we share different interviews and podcasts like this. And um, I, I look forward to uh, interacting and talking uh, with all of you. Andrew Hager, thank you so much for being with us here today. As Andrew mentioned earlier in the show, they are still looking for a permanent home for the Presidential Pet Museum, but the pandemic is making a physical reopening even more challenging. But Andrew does have an exciting update since we last spoke, he has published his book. It's called All American Dogs, A History of Presidential Pets from Every Era. And here are some fun facts from the book that we called. Of the past 46 presidents, 31 have had at least one dog in the White House. President Hoover's Belgian shepherd, whose name was King Tut, helped him win the election after the dog appeared in a campaign photo. And get this, George H.W. Bush apparently sometimes took showers together with his English Springer Spaniel, Millie. If you'd like to learn more dog facts and check out the book, we have a link to that in today's show notes. Well, that is all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you for joining us on The Long Leash. If you have a suggestion for a guest who might be perfect for our show, please let us know. You can get in touch with us via our website at longleashshow.com. Also on that website, you can get access to all of our back catalog of episodes, as well as the links to where you can subscribe to The Long Leash in your favorite podcast app. I hope you will check out the other shows on Dog Podcast Network. We have a whole bunch of them, and you can find that on Dog Podcast Network's website, which is dogpodcastnetwork.com. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm 
Aloha.